welcome to the Hashimoto's Doctor Podcast. You're now part of a growing community of people determined to take their health back through education and self-empowerment. But because of the healthcare system today, we don't have access to the types of healthcare that we want. So we have to do things differently. We've got to do things smarter, and we do that by becoming our own advocates. This podcast will give you the perspective and thoughts of one of the world's leading Hashimoto's doctors. So let's get started. Hi everyone, Dr. Shook here. I hope you're doing well today. In today's podcast, what I want to do is expand on one of our previous podcasts where I discussed several different ways. We, we actually went into five different ways that that poor thyroid hormone activity, or I use the word function, or poor thyroid physiological stimulation of your body can create a lot of different negative effects. And, you know, I used, I want to just say this again because this is worth repeating over and over and over. I use the, I describe it as poor or suboptimal stimulation of your body by your thyroid hormone because it's not just about quantity. Remember that for your, for your body to have an appropriate response or an, you know, an optimal response to to your thyroid hormone, you, you have to have several different, there, there are several different pieces of that, right? There's a, you have to be able to produce the quantity that's required, right? So production's important. And that's primarily what your primary care doctor and your endocrinologist are typically going to be able to assist you with, which is an, a replacement therapy, right? A hormone replacement therapy, which is, <clears throat> which is very important if you're deficient. However, you've always, you always want to look at the underlying mechanisms behind why that is occurring because most commonly that is due to an autoimmune process where your thyroid is actually being destroyed by your immune system and this is 80 to 90 percent of cases of low thyroid function and this can result in uh, lots of different uh, breakdowns throughout your physiology throughout your uh, your thyroid physiology especially so so number one production right number two is transportation can you transport the thyroid hormone that's in circulation throughout the body appropriately so that it's available for the cells of the body to use. That can break down a lot of different ways as well. So quantity is just one piece, then there's transportation, which has, there are several ways transportation can be affected, and then you you go further into sensitivity. So do you, do, is, are the cells of your body, is your body sensitive to the hormone that's in circulation? Again, another, you know, multifaceted, many ways it can break down, and then you have a detoxification and elimination of the hormone. So production, Transportation, sensitivity, detoxification, breakdown and elimination of the hormone. These are all, you know, this is the, that's the very 30,000 foot overview of the, the numerous ways that the thyroid physiology can break down. I estimate it's somewhere, you know, up, upwards of 50 different ways that the thyroid hormone physiology can break down, especially in light of research that came out in 2016 on how environmental chemicals, agricultural and industrial, are having negative effects on thyroid hormone physiology at just about every step of the way. So this is this is really important for us to you know for us to consider, look at, and understand. Um, we discussed in a previous podcast, you know, the five primary things, primary symptoms that I see occurring, and I wanted to, I wanted to really focus on weight weight gain or uh, and primarily it's weight gain. Okay, I mean, so I know a lot of people cannot, and I've worked with I've worked with a lot of people that that can't that cannot gain weight, but I, there are most people have problems losing weight with, with hypothyroidism. So we're going to focus more on that. I'll touch on the, uh, the, any uh, inability to, um, to properly or sufficiently gain weight because that's a big, that's, that's a problem as well. We'll talk about that, but I really want to focus on weight loss, inability to lose weight, weight loss resistance, especially with calorie restricted diets, exercise, you know, doing what you think you should be doing, um, utilizing your, your, thyroid hormone replacement you know a lot of people they're hypothyroid they have low thyroid hormone levels they they go to their doctor that's confirmed the doctor gives them a medication and they're like yes finally i'll start losing weight and then they don't lose weight or they'll gain weight on thyroid hormone replacement so there's and there's reason there's reason for that Uh, it's a conversion issue and you may be making more reverse t3 and there are numerous reasons that that can occur and if you make Reverse T3 is a hormone that your body not normally makes, but if you make it at a higher level, uh, if your ratios are off, you need to look at, at your reverse T3 to your total T3, and you can look at the, the ratios and the amounts there, and you can see if it's, uh, if it's significantly higher 
uh, and it's not that they should be equal, but if the ratio is, is uh, not optimal, then you will end up with a scenario where the reverse T3 is blocking the T3 from actually attaching itself to your cells and stimulating your metabolism. So it's really important to consider that. You've got to look at the ratio, not just the quantity of reverse T3. But so sometimes thyroid hormone replacement, uh, taking T4, which is what's primarily prescribed, which helps a ton of people and is a, is a wonderful uh, tool to have available. It sometimes, especially depending on the person's physiology, it, they may, you may disconvert, you may convert. Instead of that T4 to more T3, you have a higher uh, production of reverse T3. That could be due to a lot of different things. Uh, primarily, we see inflammatory load. If there's a high inflammatory level, or if the person has deficiencies in zinc, selenium, iron, uh, those are a few things that we'll see that are required. The, uh, the enzymes, your body has enzymes that assist with the conversion of T4 to T3. In, partic in particular, 5' prime di diiodinase is the one that helps with the conversion to T3. If you, and it's a selenium-dependent um, enzyme. So if you don't have selenium at normal levels, then it can cause a problem and you don't you can't produce the enzyme and then therefore you don't convert well and more of it goes down in the reverse t3 pathway which then creates issues right and so some people will take these hormones and they're like i'm, I'm gaining weight I don't, I don't feel well what's going on well you've got to look at the full thyroid physiology so kind of jumped a little bit ahead of myself there uh, talking about reverse t3 but that's one of the main reasons that with especially with thyroid hormone replacement you might not you might not do as well as you you should, or you might actually gain weight. I mean, I've seen that occur. Um, other things that that we see very commonly are nutrient issues. Where you know, if you're if you you're not losing weight, you're you have issues with conversion. Like you might have lower T3 levels. You're not converting your T4 to T3, uh, and that's there are several reasons. Again, conversion is more than just a deficiency of a mineral. It's, it's really, it comes down to uh, several things, uh, elevated cortisol levels, high inflammatory load. You know, when you talk about like, well, what drives cortisol? Well, any time, any type of stressor. So there are three different types of stress. There are chemical, physical, and emotional stresses. So, you know, emotional stress, you know, just name it, right? <laughs> uh, do you, um, if you live in our modern, modern world, you're subjected to stress at higher levels than we've probably ever been subjected to. Uh, and stress, you know, emotional, you've got family, um, if you work, uh, you know, you, you name it. If uh, financial stresses can occur, all these things can drive it, right? So emotional stresses and that elicits and stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight response that drives up cortisol. Cortisol can wreak havoc on lots of different physiology throughout the body, but thyroid hormone conversion is one in particular. And, um, you know, you've gotta, you gotta look at that and say, okay, how do we address the root driving process, which could be a stressor, but it's it's really never one thing. I never see it as like one thing. That would be amazing and awesome if the majority of people had one thing. But no, it's what happens is we are complex people. Complex systems make up our body, and we often have many things overlapping that, that drive this, this physiology that's not optimal and that, that really... Um, it's creating a lot of problems for us. So conversion is a, is a big issue, you know, and this is this is not just reverse T3, right? And I'm not just talking about reverse T3. I'm just talking maybe you don't have adequate T3 levels because you're not converting op optimally. And so there's a lot of things that we can look at and we can consider doing to try and help that that process. There's a lot of testing that we can do to help us identify potential drivers of, of disconversion or poor conversion. And so those are those are some of the things. Other things that, you know, I would say, I kind of got ahead of myself talking about this conversion issue. Other things that I think are, are major drivers of, probably more common than anything, of, of poor thyroid hormone stimulation of the cells of your body, therefore poor metabolism and resistance to weight loss or even weight gain, the things that will drive that, I think the most common thing that we see is, an infl is a higher inflammatory load. And this is really important to understand because I will tell you that whenever I'm working with someone, the most common things that, that we see, I would have to say, number one is going to be a high inflammatory load. And so there are a few different markers that we can look at, um, you know, biochemical markers, we can just run some labs and look at, but there are a few things that are a little bit harder to evaluate and interpret. And um, 
for so one is um, really looking at your your C-reactive protein level, which is an inflammatory marker. Uh, another one is looking at your homocysteine. It's another byproduct of metabolism. It is also an inflammatory marker. We know that C-reactive protein and homocysteine at high levels are a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Risk risk factors probably. You know, even just as scary as cardiovascular disease is neurodegenerative conditions. So, uh, degeneration of our brain because their higher inflammatory loads create a lot of negative uh, side effects. And so, we know that you know risk of Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, and these these inflammatory processes are it puts we're at greater risk um, with um, with higher you know higher inflammatory markers now. Probably the greatest driver of inflammation that we find is Hashimoto's or autoimmunity. And when you have an autoimmune process, you have you don't necessarily have high C-reactive protein or high homocysteine. If you have destruction of tissues, like let's say it's rheumatoid arthritis where you have tissue destruction that's on a massive scale, yeah, C-reactive protein is often very high. It's you know that's one that we can measure. But with Hashimoto's, it's often you, it's often um, not elevated or it's, you know, it's, it's only functionally elevated, which is what we think is not ideal, but it's not lab high. And I'm referring to, again, the, the inflammatory load, uh, like the C-reactive protein. So with Hashimoto's, you don't often see those, the C-reactive protein elevated. But the autoimmune process itself, if you have not worked to actively dampen the driving processes or the things that we believe to, to be drivers and contributors to the autoimmune process, then oftentimes you're going to have higher, inf- higher uh, cytokine loads, which are proteins produced by the immune system. They're, they're chemical messengers. They actually cross-talk with other systems of the body. So it's not like it's produced by the immune system, so it only impacts the immune system. No, we know that the, the body is much more complex and intelligent than that. Uh, one system influences other, it, the, the systems of the body influence the other systems. Um, it's just, it's how it works. So important to, to keep that in perspective and, and understand that when you have an autoimmune process, you're driving a higher inflammatory load and that will create problems with sensitivity to hormones, conversion. You know, I mentioned a lot of things that can be affected. Uh, T4 to T3 conversion can be affected by inflammatory processes. Um, you're talking about endocrine wide so your hormone producing system right endocrine wide disruption with high inflammatory loads you uh, decreased uh, tsh production at the pituitary disruption of your hypothalamus which is the central structure in the brain that signals the pituitary it does that through trh another hormone um, you can you could see disruption there of tr trh you could see disruption of tsh by the pituitary you could see a disruption of thyroid hormone uh, quantity production conversion you can see the disruption of sensitivity at the cell. I mean, you just about name it at every process, every step through the process, you could see disruption or suboptimal function due to higher inflammatory load. And these these higher cytokines are a contributing factor to that. So I really wanted to share this because weight, inability to lose weight, and this resistance to weight loss, even on a low-calorie diet, low-calorie diet with exercise or just exercise, is you know you've got to look hormonally and you've got to consider these things that it's not just the quantity of hormone and so many people are not aware of these other factors because when you go to your doctor and you have you know a thyroid problem what do they look at as the as the thing that is that is really the majority of doctors uh, look at as the only thing that they can really help you with which is which is true it's TSH right usually they just look at TSH if it's normal they're like ah it's not your thyroid you know but well, maybe it's not the quantity of the hormone, but it, it, could, it could definitely be this other physiology, which is what we see is wrong with most people, quite frankly. Um, most people that, that I work with have typically have, you know, they've got the, the supplementation, someone's supplementing with something, right? It might not be what we consider like optimal levels, thyroid hormone physi- physiological levels, but it's considered normal, you know, um, according to, you know, what's what's the medical standard and which is, you know, which helps a ton of people. So it's not to be, you know, scoffed at or criticized. It's really an essential part. Your doctors are doing exactly what they're trained to do. It's a valuable tool to help you and they're an important part of your healthcare team. But it's it's not the whole picture. And this is what we often find and it's it's more complex than that. So weight loss resistance, those are a lot, those are some very, very common things. I could go on and on and on, but we don't, I don't want the this episode to go this long or, or to go too long. The, the other thing I want to talk about just briefly was touch on um, 
you know, an inability to gain weight. When we see an inability to gain weight, the first thing we look at is absorption of nutrients. Do you have a, prop, a problem with absorption? Are you not absorbing optimally? Do you have... Um, do you have an inflammatory issue of the gut? Do you have some kind of infection? Do you have pancreatic insufficiency? Do you have uh, problems with um, you know, your, your gallbladder not uh, releasing bile and you're not breaking down and absorbing fats properly? You know, do you have hypochlorhydria or lower stomach acidity? Do you have, do you, and if you do, that's gonna disrupt the, 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 the digestive process after that, which really the stomach acid, stomach acidity is really critical and it's one of the things that's you know when you're digesting food you know the first step is you chew the food right and you mix enzymes in your saliva with the food and then you it goes down the esophagus into the stomach and the acid and stomach start, start working on it it's pretty high up in the in the digestive tract you know it gets when it gets lower it leaves the stomach the pancreas and the gallbladder start producing enzymes that mix with the food and then there are brush border enzymes throughout the, the small intestine that help to break down the foods and the sugars and help you to start absorbing. But if you don't have adequate acidity or it's suboptimal, then you can have problems with you know, absorbing your nutrients. And so there's a lot of other things that can go on there, but you know, functionally speaking, the things that we often see are, are some of those problems. And you know, you gotta say, well, why is the stomach acid low or why is this occurring? And then there's that kind of leads you to further considerations like uh, does someone have H. pylori, right, uh, Helobacter pylori, which is, a, which is a bacteria that can infect the gut, the stomach primarily, and it burrows into the, the, the stomach wall and it shuts down or it decreases stomach acidity production by the parietal cells. So if someone's got H. pylori, you've got to address that. That's a chronic infection that can decrease stomach acid and create a lot of digestive problems and snowball into other issues, uh, but it, it also you know, it also is an immune stimulating uh, infection. So your immune system sees it, may not be able to get rid of it, and it can chronically stimulate the immune system, driving the immune process, which is not what we want to do with autoimmunity, right? It's not what we want to do. So lots of things to talk about here, um, lots of things to consider, and I would give you some recommendations, but the fact is I'm trying to walk you through thought processes here because it's not as easy as saying, take this or do that. It's really, really not. It's, it's, you, you, you've got to be a little bit more specific as to what's going on. And because everyone's unique and individual, we find when we work with people, it's, it's harder to make generalized recommendations. You, you definitely can, can start with eating a whole foods diet, always a good upgrade. Um, in, you know, I, I really never see that as a huge problem unless you have a special circumstance. Um, so you know, before changing your diet or doing anything special, you know, always get professional advice and, and guidance from your doctor. But it's, it's important to know that usually high food, um, or whole food, I, sh I should say, whole food uh, diets are an upgrade. And they, they can help with a lot of problems. They, they're more nutrient dense. They're, um, you know, they're, they're free of a lot of uh, irritants. Though fruits and vegetables can be irritating. I mean, they have lectins and saponins and phytates and these other ingredients, these other components of them that can be irritating to the gut. But in general, it's, it's usually a fantastic upgrade that can change your life, just, just trying to eat whole foods. And then there are more specialized diets you can get into. And, you know, we use probably 10 different diets in our, in our practice with people trying to figure out what's best and most ideal for them. But, you know, ultimately, long term, you just want to use, you know, initially you want to use a diet that helps you heal. And then as you're, as you're healthier, you want to expand your, your dietary intake of, of foods and you want to get back to something that's more of a, normal sustainable diet right you, you don't you shouldn't have to eat a an ultra specialized diet forever but you do need to learn what's healthy what's healthy for you and then stay with that and that's really i will tell you what the the secret to losing weight is is actually getting trying to get you healthy right usually obesity people don't think about this but obesity and being overweight that's a side effect of poor energy metabolism primarily usually i mean that's usually what we see and so if you can investigate why the person has poor energy production then, and you can address that, then they lose weight. They lose weight. They have more optimal physiology and health. The mistake is looking at calories and saying, hey, it's a calorie thing. Well, I mean, that could be a contributing factor, but the, the majority of the problem becomes, for a lot of people that we see, especially like, again, right, your, your resistance to weight loss um, with exercise, with low-calorie diets, 
or you can't keep weight off. And that's usually, that's usually because you might lose weight with some of these strategies, but then you gain it back because it's not a normal dietary approach. I mean, you've got you to lose weight by getting healthy. And you get healthy by, by actually eating real food and learning how to, how to eat and what you should be doing and looking at these biochemical problems that could be causing you all these, these, this dysfunction, right? This suboptimal hormonal physiology. And uh, so anyway, I hope this helps you to better understand, you know, weight loss resistance with, you know, low calorie diets and, and uh, exercise or maybe rebound gaining weight, why you're not able to keep it off. It comes back to physiology and you're just, you're, you may not be eating, you know, a healthy diet that is going to allow you to maintain and sustain vibrant health and optimal weight. So things you got to consider, but if there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. I appreciate you hanging out today. You know, it's my mission to help educate you, help you become your own advocate so that you can be a better partner with your healthcare provider. And it's my mission to help one person at a time because I know if I can help you, we'll help your family. That will help your community and ultimately we can change the world just by making a difference by with one person. So hope it helps you out. If there's anything we can do for you, don't hesitate to reach out to us and um, hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Talk to you again soon. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed hanging out behind the scenes with Dr. Shook. You can also talk with and learn from Dr. Shook through Facebook Live on our Facebook page at the office of Dr. Brad Shook. Don't forget, you can also get access to our videos, guidebooks, and thyroid programs at www.drbradshook.com. Oh yeah, and don't forget one more thing. We can change the world one person, one family, and one community at a time. Until next time, remember, today is your day, and no one will tell you who you are and what you can be.